Good morning. Welcome to our webinar uh, this morning on creating a livable community. What's in your toolbox? We're really excited to have you with us today. This is the latest in our housing webinar series. If you've missed any of our previous webinars, you can find those posted on our website. Um, this morning, I'm really excited to um, welcome my friend and former co-worker, Patty Mulvihill. Patty is the general counsel to the League of Oregon Cities, and she previously served as the assistant general counsel to the League. In her role as general counsel, she provides legal advice to League employees and its board of directors. She also provides training on municipal fundamentals to elected and appointed officials across the state of Oregon, and she serves on various committees that focus on municipal legal matters and provides facilitation and mediation services to municipalities. She previously worked as a city attorney for the city of Bloomington, and she represented um, the d police department, the planning department, and the housing and neighborhood development department. Um, and Patty and I worked together pretty extensively during that time period on these tools to make Bloomington um, a better place. And so we're really excited to share this with you this morning. And I am going to let Patty um, introduce yourself a little bit more and then we'll get started. So Patty, thanks for being here this morning. I know it's very early where you are. It is very early. Um, it required me to get off at about 515 this morning and I would only do that for somebody like Lisa. So um, I, I see that we've got about 14 attendees on and some of you I think I know for sure. I know Susan Sandberg's already said hello. It will be hard not to call you Counselor Sandberg, but I don't have to anymore because I'm not a city employee. Um, <laughs> But as Lisa mentioned, I worked for the city of Bloomington for about 13 years, um, and I worked closely with uh, Lisa. And at the time, it was Tom Makuda, who was the planning director, and Christy Langley when I left. So I'm pretty familiar with um, code enforcement and livability tools. Um, when we get into the presentation, you'll see that we're going to go over three tools today. Um, I'm going to um, tap into Lisa to handle the second tool because it's more of a carrot approach as opposed to the stick approach. Most of the time you don't ask lawyers for help with carrots, you ask us for help when it's time to wield the um, stick or the hammer. Um, but since transitioning um, my move, for those of you who may not know, I do live in Oregon now. Um, and we um, have about 241 cities that I work with directly. Um, and I've worked with quite a few of them on code enforcement, particularly my rural communities out in Eastern Oregon. Um, half of my cities have populations of less than 5,000 persons. Um, so they don't have in-house legal counsel. So they work with us quite regularly. Um, so it's a topic I'm somewhat familiar with. I've also gotten incredibly used to doing trainings via the Zoom platform in the last 12 months. Um, can everybody see my slideshow? Okay, I'm gonna assume that's a yes. Um, perfect, one person said yes, awesome. So we're gonna talk today about creating a livable community. Um, and generally speaking, what I'm gonna say is that questions are a good thing. I know it's harder to do in a Zoom platform setting, but in my experience, the best trainings are more of a conversation and a dialogue um, than some random faceless person on a video screen lecturing at you um, for however long it takes. So if you have questions, um, feel free to type them in the comment feature. Lisa is going to be monitoring them. Um, and if she thinks it's a question that needs to be asked right away, she'll interrupt me. She's quite good at doing that. We worked well together for many years, so she knows how to just make me be quiet. Um, and if it's something she thinks that can wait till the um, end, we'll do that. Um, I will say what I'm going to try and do is after each tool that we discuss, I will try and stop and pause and ask if there's any questions there. Um, and then a little up, I usually try and make pretty good eye contact, um, but because I have to do this without my three monitors I usually work with, um, I had to print out my notes. So if I'm looking down, I apologize, but um, I, I don't have multiple screens available to me. Um, and so doing the best that I can. So we've got four objectives that I want to cover today. The first generally is to talk about what I consider a livable community. It's going to be slanted primarily from a code enforcement kind of visual aspect. Um, and then we're going to walk through three tools that I have found success with in both Indiana and Oregon um, that help build those types of livable communities that we're all looking for. Tool one is local codes and regulations. And by that, I mean the ordinances and resolutions and general policies and procedures that cities and counties primarily adopt to try and make it so that their residents and businesses 
feel that their neighborhoods and their built environment is secure and safe and one that they wanna live in and do business in. The second tool talks about government incentives. Um, sometimes what we've found is that it takes certain people a little bit of a nudge to do better and meet standards. And in other instances, we have people who really want to be part of the solution. They just lack fiscal resources to do so. And so that's where cities and counties can step in and provide some financial incentives, either direct cash, tax abatements, et cetera, to try and help put those people at the level they want to be at and we want them to be at. And then the last tool we'll talk about are enforcement and penalties. No one likes to get to tool three. Uh, and in my personal experience, in 95% of the cases, we don't have to get to tool three. But you need that tool because unfortunately, when you're talking about the way your community looks, if you have even 5% of the community that's not meeting your desired standards, that 5% can negatively impact the other 95%. So tool three will become a pretty important tool that we need to talk about. So what makes a community livable? If you look back kind of at the history of the creation of local government from the inception in this country, it's really been primarily focused on three basic things, public health, safety, and the welfare of the constituents that we serve. And you'll see that across the board, pretty much in all 50 states and almost every city's charter or governing documents, it will repeatedly talk about the main focus of the city or the county is to provide for the public health, safety, and welfare. Now, when we started, historically, that meant things like clean drinking water, uh, adequate fire service, uh, making sure the streets were safe. And those are still true, and they're still valid. But as society has grown and expanded, so too has the definition of community livability and the definition of what it means to provide a safe and appropriate place that protects the welfare of the community. Now it can include things like, do we have an appropriate multi-use trail system? How are our overall park systems looking like? Should we be providing more money to public libraries? Do we have enough greeting space? Should we have a senior center? And what makes keeping the public safe has expanded into a whole big concept. And so if I was going to teach today on everything that would make your communities livable, we would have to buckle up and sit down for several days. <laughs> so we're not gonna do that. Um, what we're gonna try and focus on today is those smaller, more immediate visual things that we can do to make our communities livable. And by that, I mean, typically the, the safety um, of our structures and then how we operate as citizens with each other. So kind of making sure we don't have nuisances so that neighbor A isn't being unreasonably annoyed by neighbor B. And those are kind of gonna be the focus that we see. They all channel into what a lot of counties and cities refer to as code enforcement issues. What I've seen since I've moved out here to the West Coast um, is that a lot of our counties and cities are, are calling their code enforcement programs community livability programs. Um, one is because code enforcement has a negative connotation and they're trying to show people that it's not the government actor that's trying to be bad and heavy handed. It's really a community vision that's been developed and the community has asked the government to make sure that that vision is allowed to flourish. And so when I built the program, I, I went with the community livability standard instead of code enforcement, because I do think it's a much more accurate reflection of what local governments are trying to do when they're in enforcing and drafting their codes. So elements of community livability. Um, so the first one really in terms of your traditional kind of code enforcement issue is the exterior of our buildings and even the lots themselves, right? So does, is the building falling in? Well, does it look like the building on the right of this photograph, the two on the right, right? Like if I was gonna give every person who's on this call an option and said, do you want to live in the building on the far left or would you rather build, live in the buildings on the far right? I'm gonna assume everybody says far left, far left. And it's because the buildings on the right appear, at least structurally, to be unsafe, right? They're falling in, they're lacking windows, they're lacking doors. They don't look like they've been maintained in any way, shape, or form. And you would also, my guess is, 
not want to buy the house on the left if you were looking to, because it's not ideal, right? Is that the type of neighborhood you want to live in when half of it is decayed and rotting and not being taken care of? And so as a community, it's fairly normal for people to say, we, we can't have those two buildings on the right occurring. And if they have occurred, then we need to take some steps to bring them back up to code. In addition to how those buildings look, we also have concerns about how property looks on the outside. So you've probably all driven through neighborhoods where you've got that one lot where the grass is like 18 inches, 20 inches high, right? It looks like you're gonna to have to have special equipment to go in and mow it. Or you've got shrubs and trees that are so overgrown, you can't see the front door. Um, all of those things, while they may not be structural for the building, they do impact how that neighborhood or even that street feels in terms of whether or not it's a livable street from a normal community standard. One of the other big things that we've seen, particularly in the last 50 to 60 years, is the importance that historical architecture plays on our communities. And so you're starting to see cities, not as much counties, but counties definitely do historic preservation, but you're starting to see cities and counties really take a hard look at the historic fabric of their communities. Are there streets that really have a historic appeal? And so I'm going to assume since a lot of you on the call, while maybe not from Bloomington, maybe you've been to Bloomington or whatever, um, it's, well, it's not my hometown, but I lived there for 20 years. Um, there are definitely streets streets within Bloomington that have a different feel and they have a different vibe. And part of that is because they were built in the 1920s, right? And those properties have been maintained. And because they've been maintained and the city has taken an effort to ensure their maintenance, it feels different. And that vibe kind of carries over into the businesses and the surrounding areas and surrounding properties and kind of stabilizes everything in a way that makes people want to live there, develop property there, and start home businesses there or businesses adjacent in adjacent commercial districts. Another thing, particularly in light of the economic recession that happened in the early 2000s and what some experts are saying is a coming recession because of the COVID-19 pandemic are that we, when we have vacant properties that we make sure that they're still maintained. Um, Indiana is one of those states that has affirmatively declared vacant properties to be at a high risk for becoming public nuisances, and they've given authority to cities and counties to aggressively try and regulate and tackle those properties so that blight doesn't kind of spread throughout. Um, and so one of the key elements is making sure we figure out a way to address vacant properties. We may not be able to help everybody from losing their property through unfortunate circumstances, but we can try and make sure that that unfortunate circumstance doesn't carry out and continue to spread. And the last one that a lot of people forget about, because um, a lot of times when we think about code enforcement, we really just think about buildings or streets, but really livability is also about being respectful of one another's neighbors. And I learned this personally most key because when I was at um, the city of Bloomington, I was also responsible um, for a large portion of my career um, for the animal control department, um, as well as the police department. And both of those two departments deal with some pretty big common issues that do impact livability. So when it comes to animals, one of the things that really seems to affect people's enjoyment of their homes is incessant barking from nuisance dogs. Um, it can really change the tenor of an entire neighborhood if that issue is not resolved. And unfortunately, while again, 95% of the people in a neighborhood would be good neighbors and resolve the issue of their animal barking too much on their own, 5% won't. And that's where government actors can step in and kind of forcibly mandate um, some more respectful, respectful behavior. The other one for those of you that um, have ever lived in a college town like Bloomington is noise regulation. Um, I remember what it was like to be 21 and having a great time, but I probably wasn't terribly respectful of my neighbors all the time. And that's where noise ordinances can come in. Because again, um, if noise carries three or four houses down and you're the person who has a six month infant at home trying to get some sleep, um, that noise really can impact how you feel about living in that neighborhood, living in that city. And all of those things kind of taken together are really the elements that I encourage people to think about when they're trying to say, 
do I have a livable community? And, and I think that really starts first with your local tool, with your local tool number one, which is your local codes and regulations. So I'm gonna go back. So what I would encourage those of you who have county codes of ordinances or city codes of ordinances is to ask yourself, does your current code cover a lot of the elements that are listed on the screen and that we may talk about today? If they don't, ask yourself, should they? Um, and if they should, why? And what should we do about it? If they do cover these things, are they still working for you? Um, I will take two seconds to say one of my biggest pet peeves as an attorney is that um, government is great at enacting policy and ordinances and not so great at going back and reviewing those policies and ordinances to see A, if they're still being followed and B, if they still are effective in accomplishing the goals they originally set out. Once you adopt something, you should establish a period of time where you review it. Review doesn't mean update, but review to make sure that you're still on point and are on target with where you wanna go. And that kind of transitions us into the first tool, uh, local codes and regulations. Do we have any questions so far before I kind of get into tool one? Not yet. Okay. So local codes and regulations. So when I think about the types of codes that we can adopt at the local level, um, particularly in Indiana, um, so it, Indiana says it's a home rule state. It's not quite as generous of a home rule state as I think the legislature would like you to believe. And so you, you have a little less leeway um, than some other states in the types of local regulations you can do. Um, but the first main one, and we'll go through each of these individually with their own slide, but generally speaking, um, our livability codes, a lot of cities refer to those as property maintenance codes instead of livability codes. So you might see those interchangeably. Um, rental registration and inspection codes, unsafe and vacant structure codes, nuisance codes. Um, those can include uh, noise and they can also just be a general catch all of anything a public nuisance, anything that a reasonable person uh, would find to be negatively impacting their ability to enjoy their property or their premises. And then historic preservation codes. Um, those are actually code enforcement tools in and of themselves. Um, and, and they should be looked at from that lens as well, because they can provide a lot of stabilization to your community in a way that I think is not always understood or respected. So your livability codes or your property maintenance codes. So there's all kinds of ways in which these are regulated. Some have everything on this list in their codes, others just do tiny portions of it. But generally speaking, um, livability codes seem to get most of their basis in what's called the International Property Maintenance Code. So starting in the early 1900s, uh, various regions of the United States started adopting building codes, plumbing codes, electrical codes, stuff like that. And there was kind of a, it was kind of a regional effect. So the Southern states had, a, had their own set of codes, the New England states had their own set of codes. There was a whole set of codes for like Colorado and West. Um, and around the late 60s and 70s, they created an international code council to kind of create one uniform code. Um, and that code council, in addition to having an, you know, an international building code and electrical code, they also have a property maintenance code that's really geared towards what happens to a structure after it's built. So the building code is gonna say, you have to build your structure so that it meets these standards. And then until a maintenance code is in place, there's nothing after that. So you add in a livability code or a maintenance code to make sure that once it's built to code, it then has to always be maintained at code so that you don't see it just start to slip and slip and slip and become those horrible buildings that were on one of my first slides. So they typically tend to focus a lot on how the exterior properties are maintained. What does it mean to be clean, safe, and sanitary? Um, so a lot of times that means you can't have painting and peeling paint. So that's not allowed. You've got to make sure that the exterior is, is kept nice. Um, sometimes people mean clean and safe to also, you know, make sure that, you know, your fencing isn't broken, um, that it's secure, that if you've got bike racks, they're working properly so that everything is safe, that you don't have standing water on your property. So if you've got drainage issues, you've got to get those fixed. 
Um, and that's considered safe and sanitary because if you're in the Midwest and you've got standing water in the summer, you're probably gonna have a mosquito problem. Uh, they have to be graded to prevent erosion. You don't want erosion that can create all kinds of issues as well. Um, that your structures have to be kept free from rodent coverage. So from mice, rats, raccoons, possums, all of those good things. So they don't infiltrate your house and then start spreading their colonies to neighboring houses. Um, I always remember a story from my time when I was with the city. Um, so in Bloomington, at, at the time they did, I, I, uh, I'm not sure if they still do, but at the time they prohibit, prohibited um, like living room furniture from being placed on the outside. So you couldn't have couches on the front porch. Um, and one of our housing inspectors was responding to a complaint about a couch um, on the front porch. And one of the residents, a younger college female said something like, why does it matter? Why do you care? And um, the housing inspector got on the couch, jumped out and a bunch of mice just scattered because they had lived in this nice cozy little couch. Um, so those are even levels of degree that cities will get to when it talks about their livability codes because they've learned that that couch is actually going to create vermin. Some of the things that you also worry about, particularly in urban areas where you've got structures that are generally closer together because your lots are smaller, is that exhaust vents don't discharge their waste or their steam directly onto their neighbor's property. Um, so that they're somehow um, situated so that they're going in a place that's not gonna mess up or mess with your neighbor's zones. And then the other big one for those of you that have an interest in land use development is making sure that your zoning code requirements um, like accessories are actually maintained. So probably in the last 15 or 20 years, you've seen commitments from local um, codes that there be things like public art displays, particularly when it comes to commercial buildings or large scale developments, maybe even um, I've seen some codes where they've got a large scale subdivision or residential development and they require public art there. Um, what you want to make sure when you review your codes is, is you required the developer to invest probably some significant funds in creating public art, but you as a city need to make sure that there's a way to ensure that that art is maintained over a period of time. Um, the worst thing that can happen is let's say you, you've required a beautiful mural, um, but it's not really being maintained and now it's just graffiti or it's peeling paint and it's creating or attracting other nuisances. So all of those things are what I would typically see inside of a livability code or a property maintenance code as they're sometimes called. The other thing, which I will admit is a little harder to do now than it was a few years ago in Indiana is rental registration and inspection codes. So what we started seeing, this trend actually began uh, in university towns. I believe it first actually started in Southern university towns and it's worked its way like Northeast and West was that cities started requiring every rental unit in a district um, to be registered uh, with the city or the county. And in some cases to also be inspected and permitted by the governmental entities. And there was a couple reasons for this. And I think most of those reasons are still sound. So for example, if you take um, a city like Bloomington, when I had left, 67% of the housing stock was all rental unit property. And so by requiring those properties to be registered, inspected and maintained to a certain standard, the city was essentially guaranteeing that almost 70% of its housing stock would always be in a stable condition. It would always be maintained in a manner that was consistent with a code, which meant that it already had won more than half of its battle and ensuring livability, um, because it made sure that we would have seven, we would have more than a more than the majority of our property would be stabilized. Um, the second reason a lot of um, people regulate them is because it is a commercial business. I know people don't like to think of it that way, um, but typically landlords um, are in a commercial business, and we regulate lots of business as local government. The third thing is really for a public safety purpose. Uh, my husband is a former fire service fire chief, um, and he would tell you that it's super helpful to when you're responding to a structure fire, if it's not owner occupied, to know how to contact that owner so you can get details and information, continue access if you have to do a fire investigation. So those are some of the reasons that you would do it. And then the other one is, is that you multiple studies will show uh, and this is not true for everybody. Um, I, I know some amazing landlords who, and I would live in their properties in a heartbeat. Um, but studies consistently show across the board, be it in Indiana or otherwise, 
um, that owner occupied property is traditionally better maintained than rental property in the sense that people who own their property that they live in take better care of it than a landlord who rents it. Again, not besmirching landlords. I think there are many, many wonderful ones, just kind of quoting some generalities from some studies. Um, commonly, a lot of these codes will typically permit inspections of interiors if a complaint is, re is received. So I would say if I've looked at probably 50 rental inspection codes, probably more than half only inspect if there's a complaint. So a tenant complains, the landlord complains against the tenant, a neighbor complains, or another agency complains. So fire department gets called into a building because of a fire alarm issue while they're in there. One of the firefighters sees something they don't like. They call a code inspector and say, I think you've got an issue at this place. Other organizations, uh, Bloomington's one of them. I know a couple other cities, West Lafayette, Goshen, uh, a couple other cities in Indiana inspect on a regular basis. Essentially, they, they have a policy in place or an ordinance in place that says, if you're gonna rent in Bloomington, you have to, you have to be inspected on a certain basis, three, four, or five years. Um, and you, your level of permit depends on when the building was constructed or essentially how many problems you've had with your property in the past. But what I would say is in Indiana, because of some relatively recent legislation, you've got to be mindful if you don't have a rental inspection program now. Well, actually, period, you have to because of some recent rulings by the Indiana Supreme Court. But essentially, if you've got this slide written down, if you're thinking about doing a rental registration or an inspection program for rental units only, um, you need to take a look at Indiana Code 36121 through section six. Um, and what this section specifically deals with is programs that are targeted exclusively towards rental programs. So if you decided seemingly based on the way the statute's written that you were going to establish a registration and inspection program for every property, um, I would talk with your legal counsel because I think there might be some wiggle room in the statute to allow that to happen. But if you want to do that now, if you don't have a code um, or you're looking to create a code, what that statute's gonna do is put some limitations on you. So for example, right now, cities and counties cannot inspect rental units or impose a fee for that inspection if the rental unit is managed by or part of a rental unit community that is managed by a professional real estate manager and during the previous 12 months, the unit had been inspected um, or the rental community. So it doesn't even have to be your particular unit or the rental community has been inspected by HUD, the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority or any other federal or state agency or a financial or insurance institution who's authorized to do business in Indiana. The inspection that's been conducted by one of those agencies has to have been by a registered architect, professional engineer, or someone who meets the requirements as a local code inspector in your jurisdiction. So you can't inspect if it's already, if it's part of a community and it's already been inspected by somebody and it's managed by somebody who's considered to be a professional real estate manager. There's an exception. You can go in if you have a complaint um, so that's still valid. So if you've got a complaint that somebody's got a unit that's not safe or that there's a problem, you can go in and do that. Um, it does say though, just so you know, um, that there are some restrictions on what you can inspect for. So you've got to make sure that you understand uh, what that statute specifically does and how it looks. So it, it has consistently the state has consistently limited what you can do at the local level in Indiana, and this is one of them. Um, I can't give legal advice because while I have a, while I am good standing with the Indiana bar, I've let my license go inactive because I'm unwilling to pay thousands of dollars a year when I don't live there anymore. Um, but what I would suggest is that I still think there's enough room in the statute as it's written to really have a good inspection program that impacts rental units. Um, and I think if what you're starting to see is a community is that you're having issues with rental properties, 
then this still might be a tool for you to consider. Um, this is several years old now, but probably seven or eight years ago, I was talking with, um, I, I think it was the building official, the building director, somebody high up for the city of Indianapolis. And they had conducted a study. They'd done a 10 year analysis of the vacant structures that they were having to remove. And something like 90% of all vacant structures in Indiana had been rental property for the prior seven to 10 years. And so what he was showing was that the evidence was being extrapolated. What he was saying is, look, I, I, don't, I don't want to cut out the blight. I want a vaccine that will prevent it from happening. And so he was really interested in, in having rental inspection programs because he saw that if he could put all of his efforts on the front end, he may not have to be tearing down a couple hundred structures each year. So it is a valuable tool. It's just going to be a little bit harder to wield right now. And it's one of those times where I think you would want to sit down with a lawyer and ask them how creative um, you could be if it's something you want to use. The other big one um, that I think gets used a lot is your unsafe and vacant structure codes. Well, I don't say I want to get it. I don't, I think people are intimidated by it, particularly smaller jurisdictions. Um, when I was in Indiana, I would do some trainings. Um, I think they call themselves AIM now, Accelerating Indiana Municipalities. Um, and I, I would talk with a bunch of smaller jurisdictions on a regular basis who would say, yeah, but hey, the state's unsafe building law is so complicated. And they're not wrong. Um, so in Indiana, if you are a city or county and you want to regulate unsafe or vacant structures in your jurisdiction, you're required to comply with Indiana Code Chapter 3679. Um, and with the exception of about four papers, it's really, really thick uh, and it's super complicated. And it's one of those really annoying statutes that cross references itself with like 20 other statutes. And so I think that stops a lot of people from using it. And, and that's a shame because in all of the tools in terms of code enforcement that the state lets you have, this one, they actually give cities and counties an an intense amount of authority and discretion to be really assertive uh, and really innovative in their approach to dealing with these structures. So it's one of those issues where I would strongly encourage people to look at it. Um, and I don't know if they still have it, but years ago, uh, the legal department for the city of Bloomington built a really nice handy dandy cheat sheet um, for all the different ways the unsafe building code could be used. So if we wanted to seal a building, if we wanted to repair a building, if we wanted to demolish a building, we had these different kind of flow charts that kind of walked us through the steps we need to take. Um, it might still be there if you don't want to start from scratch. But generally speaking, you can use the unsafe and vacant structure codes to adopt a local ordinance. You do have to adopt a local ordinance in order to use the state's code. Um, that's a precursor to being able to use it. Um, but what it will allow you to do once you adopt that ordinance is to aggressively, assertively, and affirmatively deal with any structure um, that is in an impaired condition that makes it unsafe to both persons or property. So if you think it's unsafe to an adjoining property, you can also take action. It allows you to address potential fire hazards um, so, for example, there was a situation one time that I worked with where um, the structure itself was perfectly sound, um, but we had somebody who had some significant mental health issues and they had hoarded eons and eons worth of newspapers and magazines and rubbish. And because of the way it was being maintained and stored, it was the legitimate fire hazard in a structure that if it went up, it was probably going to take out other structures with it. And because of that, we were able to go in um, and make some changes and get the person some services as well. There was some mental health issues there. Um, hazards um, to the public health. So something, so for example, if you've got a property that does have standing water um, and they're creating you know, a nice little breeding ground for mosquitoes, there's ways that you can go in um, to address that issue under the unsafe structure code. Uh, if you've got public nuisances, so, you know, if you've got something that's attractive to small kids, um, I, that's the always when I think about, you know, is the 12 year old going to be super interested in maybe try and go in there and see what's going on and you know it's probably not safe, you can use the unsafe structure code for that. 
Um, if it's dangerous to a person or property because of the way it's being maintained. So not if it's inherently structurally deficient, but if it's being maintained in a way that could be unsafe, you can use the unsafe structure code. Um, and then if, then if it's vacant or blighted, you also have some, that's your biggest leeway to be perfectly honest. Um, the simple fact that it's vacant may not necessarily mean that it's traditionally unsafe, but you can still take affirmative action just by the fact that it's vacant. Um, once you get into the unsafe structure, so if you think you have a property that's like this, there's all kinds of things that you can do. And it starts out really small and it can get up really high in terms of your authority. And what's great about this code is that you actually have the discretion at the local level to determine what type of action you need. So can the problem be remedied by just ordering the build, building sealed up? So can you get some plywood and cover up the windows and the doors and some fencing and seal it up? Is it something that can be, is it just a trash and debris issue? Is it just a matter of hauling in a dumpster and cleaning it up? Is it just that something needs to be repaired? So you've got, um, you know, you've got a backyard shed and the roof is caved in. So they just need to repair the shed, everything else is fine. Or is it so egregious that quite frankly, the entire property needs to come down? And so it kind of starts from least invasive to most invasive. And for the most part, the discretion on which property process to use is going to be left to the city or the county itself to decide, which is pretty good. There's a lot of requirements in that code, though, that you need to know about in terms of what I'm going to call due process and notice. So for the most part, absent an emergency, um, I do that because I, I think emergency is a grossly misunderstood word today. Um, just because it's not easy or you don't want to wait doesn't make it an emergency. An emergency literally has to be I have absolutely no time to go to court and get permission to do something because people will die. Um, that's generally an emergency. So absent those situations, you've got to give the property owner notice um, and you've got to give them time to correct the violation themselves. When we're talking about vacant property, that's a little harder because a lot of times it's really hard to track those people down. Um, it's hard to identify ownership so a lot of times what you'll find is that you have to actually do notice by publication in a newspaper, which is permitted, but it's gonna slow your process down um, in terms of how long it's gonna to take to actually get the problem remedied because you're gonna to have to post in the newspaper for a certain amount of time. When you issue the notice, you give the person time to correct. Hopefully they correct. Um, I would say in my experience, at least 50% of the time, the property does eventually get corrected by the property owner. Um, usually it, come, it came when I would call as the lawyer and say, no, we're serious. We're going to court. I'm going to get a lien against your property and then we're going to go in and we're going to fix it ourselves. Um, and so, but most of the time they would fix it. If they don't fix it, you do have an opportunity as a government to go in and fix it yourself, which is not cheap. Um, what the statute generally says is that if you have the staff resources and materials on hand to do it yourself, you can provided the estimated cost of you doing it yourself will not exceed $10,000. If the work that you have to do on that building or that property is likely to exceed $10,000, then you have to go out for public bid. And so when you're kind of building out your process in terms of how to respond to one of those properties, you, you wanna make sure that you, you allow yourself some time to meet the public bidding requirements. Um, because in my experience, it's going to add a minimum of at least 30 days to any process that you're actually trying to use. So you, you go through the whole process, you do the work. And so you say, okay, great, Patty, I did the work, my county or city did the work, but now the person isn't paying me back. I'm going to tell you, I'm not shocked. Um, in my experience, they, if they're not going to clean up their property, they're probably not going to pay you back. Um, there are provisions within the, the code, though, that allow you to get both a civil judgment uh, against the, the property owner, the person responsible for the property, but you can also assess it as a lien against their tax record. So at the, when they're not at the next tax sale, you can usually collect that way or two tax sales down the road. Sometimes you have to wait. It's a long game, I'll be honest, when you deal with unsafe and vacant structures. Um, you, if you expect it to go fast, your expectations are not gonna be met. When I was doing unsafe structures in Indiana, I would say a quick turnaround for me in terms of the problem was identified by the inspector and the problem was considered 
sufficiently resolved, either that the, the, the property was brought up into compliance and all fees and fines had been assessed, or the city had done the work and all costs had been recovered. I would say an average was six months, but it wasn't unusual for some of those to take up to two years to resolve. So it's a really long game process. So you have to be very patient when dealing with it. There's another provision in there if things get really bad, or if you have a structure that you think has really good potential for either resale or income earning, if you could just get it up to code, you can consider trying to get the property into a receivership. Um, I've only done that once in my career. It's really complicated. It's not used a lot, um, but you need, to, you need to know that it's there as an option and consider using it if you think you've got it. I, I think that's a, that's a tool that you really restrict to when you think that you've got a viable shot. Uh, if you remember the slide I showed you um, with the kind of dilapidated structures, um, at first blush, that's probably not something that's great for receivership, right? That's probably just tear down and start over. But there could be something we don't know about that property, right? It could be something that maybe it's in a great location. Maybe on the other side of that picture is an ocean. I don't know. Um, but you do have receivership as an option as well to consider in the unsafe code. But take a look at it. It's, it is, like I said, if you print it out, it's probably almost 30 pages worth of stuff. Um, but it's interesting. Um, it's interesting, and I encourage people to, to think about it um, as a potential option. Sorry, I clicked on something. There we go. So the next one are nuisance codes. Um, I, I will say that um, these ones, you um, people are much more passionate about the codes on this slide than they are in my experience about housing codes or quite frankly, even zoning codes. Um, so a typical one is you're gonna regulate the height of grass, weeds or noxious plants. Um, in Indiana, and I've surveyed several cities, um, some of it's been five or six years ago now, um, typical height is somewhere between, maximum height permitted is somewhere between six to 10 inches, just kind of depends on the jurisdiction. And I think it should be up to each jurisdiction. You figure out what works for you um, in terms of that. Um, I will tell you one of my most difficult, not in terms of uh, legal arguments per se, but challenging cases was there was a neighborhood in Bloomington, a very nice neighborhood in Bloomington, I would say. Um, I would imagine, well, I'm not going to guess at housing prices because I live in Oregon now. So housing prices, my, house, my, my concept of housing prices are skewed, but a very nice middle class, upper middle class neighborhood. And one of the property owners refused to mow his grass. And con consistently for years, we had abated it multiple times. It finally came to a head because he was alleging that the code that required him to mow his grass was unconstitutional. Um, he was arguing that the reason he does not mow his grass is because he's protesting the harm done to the environment by traditional urban lawn maintenance activities. And he found a law professor at the university who was willing to take the case. And we went all the way up to the Indiana Supreme Court um, and he lost. Um, so in Indiana, at least, there is no First Amendment right for your citizens to not mow their grass. So feel free. It's already been litigated and vetted for you if you're looking at doing it. Um, what I would tell you is you are 95% of the time uh, when you issue a warning, um, people will comply and they'll mow their grass, but you will have a couple people where you'll need to be prepared um, to have some city or county resources available to maybe go in and have to abate them yourself. Other good codes to have in terms of no nuisance deal with kind of what I'm going to call like trash, debris, litter, um, just being strewn about the property. Um, and it can range, right? So again, in Bloomington, you know, the, the Monday after little five, there's probably a lot of trash tickets issued because properties are little littered with red solo cups. Um, that is probably minor on the scale of debris versus somebody who's got old automobiles, tires, old construction debris, all kinds of stuff just on their front lawn. So the gamut is gonna run and you're gonna wanna make sure that your ordinance, however it's crafted, is strong enough to deal with the red solo cup issue and equally strong enough to deal with the dilapidated vehicles, the construction debris, the tires and all of that. So you're gonna wanna make sure you run the whole gamut of things. Another thing to think about since you do live in the Midwest is what do you do when snow and ice happens? 
um, particularly if you are a community that has required sidewalks in front of residential structures. So if you're one of those communities that has affirmatively installed or required property owners and developers to install sidewalks, you need to think about what do you want to do between no November and sometimes April, quite frankly, when you've got a realistic opportunity for those sidewalks to be covered in snow and ice. It is fairly common in most communities in Indiana to require the adjacent proper property owner to have to shovel the snow and make sure that the ice is removed. There's usually a grace period. Um, I've seen some communities where it's 24 hours, some communities where it's 72 hours, and they start the clock when the snowfall stops accumulating. So if the snowfall stopped accumulating at noon on Friday, that would mean in a 24 hour jurisdiction by noon on Saturday, the property owners need to shovel the snow and ice. You're gonna to wanna to think about if that's something that you should have, and if you should have, how do you want it to apply? And I would also encourage you, if you do think about a snow and ice removal, is think about the difference between commercial properties and residential properties. There are differences and you need to ask yourself if those differences warrant different standards. So, you know, if you think about a, a, like particularly a traditional square. So what I love about Indiana is most of our counties have these beautiful still old county courthouses and these beautiful county squares and you typically have much wider sidewalks or pavilions along the square. So you're going to want to ask yourself. Does my ordinance really require those businesses to shovel the entire area in front of their business? And what happens if I've got multiple business owners, but only one property owner? Is it the property owner? Is it the business owner? So commercial properties might require you to think about things a little bit differently than residential, particularly when it comes to snow and ice issues. So just take some time to think about how that may impact your community. The other big one um, that I've talked about is animals. Um, in my experience, almost 20 years now, people are more passionately upset about being having their animals regulated than they are about anything else. Um, the only time I, I've been called a truly heinous name or felt physically threatened in my time as a lawyer, um, both dealt with animal issues. But things to think about. Um, even if you're a community who doesn't want to heavily regulate animals. So there's communities who regulate how many animals people can have. They require animals to be registered, you know, to have certain requirements for how long they can be kept outside and what their, you know, leash looks like. If you, if you don't want to go that far, when it comes to building a livable community, I would encourage you to still think about, is it reasonable to have requirements in place about what happens with animals when they're off their own property. So do you want them to be leashed when they're on public sidewalks or when they're in public parks? Is a leash really required if somebody has a really well-trained dog who does require to voice commands? You know, my, my husband and I had a black lab named Jack. You know, I could put, if my husband put Jack in the down position, he could put a stake in front of Jack and leave the room for 45 minutes and come back and you know, I mean, Jack would be lying in a pool of his own saliva, but he would not have touched that stake. So do you wanna make exceptions for well-behaved dogs under voice commands? That's your call, but it is something to think about. What do you wanna do about barking issues? Um, those are tough ones. Um, what I will tell you from a legal perspective is the law has been really clear um, that nuisance barking complaints are based on a reasonable person standard. So would a reasonable person be annoyed? Um, what you'll see in a lot of different codes um, in Indiana and other states is different ways communities have tried to address it. Because in some situations, what you will have is neighbor A just hates neighbor B and neighbor B has a dog. And maybe neighbor B's dogs does bark whenever the mailman drops off mail on the front porch. But the dog barks for two minutes once a day. And neighbor A complains every day, every single day, and is hounding the city and wants the dog euthanized. That's probably not a reasonable standard. And this, the county or the city is now stuck in the middle. So what I've started to see is cities and counties kind of developing more, more protocols. So a, a nuisance dog is a dog that barks for 30 uninterrupted minutes more than three times a day. Uh, you'll start to see communities say, if you want to make the complaint, 
that's fine, but you're going to have to sign a sworn affidavit under penalties of perjury that it that the dog has met the standards. You're going to have to give us recording evidence and then we'll issue a notice of violation because we can't have inspectors out there every time. Those are things that I encourage you to think about if you need. And, and particularly with animals, when you, when you think about regulating them, I, I would encourage you to reach out to other uh, regional partners. So who else in, in your area is regulating these and what experience do they have? Uh, because at some point you'll just have to say no. And, and it's not just dogs, I should be clear. Um, with the advent of quite frankly, urban chickens, those have can become nuisance issues as well, not necessarily because of noise, uh, but because of smell. Um, people complain about the pens and the smell that they have. They will complain if there's roosters that because of the, in the crowing, um, but those are also things to think about. Um, and then codes which regulate noise that is made on property. This is another area, much like snow and ice, where when you regulate this type of thing, I encourage you to consider should you have different standards for your commercial zones, your industrial zones, and your residential zones? And do you need to establish special buffer zones? So for example, it's not uncommon for a commercial zone to butt right up against a residen residential zone. Well, if my house is on the line of the residential and commercial zone, what standard, if you have different standards, are you asking me to apply to? Because if the commercial zone gets to play noise until 2 a.m. and the residential zone only gets to have noise until 9 p.m., it doesn't do the people on the property line between those two districts any good because they're going to hear the 2 a.m. noise. And the city, as a result, whether it's your law enforcement officer, your code enforcement officer, you as an elected official are going to be constantly hearing complaints from those buffer zone residents if you don't figure out a way to address that issue. What I can tell you is a lot of cities and counties will do decibel standards. That's not necessarily required. So decades ago, there was an Indiana Supreme Court case that basically said when dealing with a noise ordinance, the only standard that's required is a reasonable person standard. So as long as the noise is objectively reasonable, given its time, its place, and its general occurrence, it's fine. So for example, if you rent an apartment, if you've got somebody who rents an apartment above a bar, it is objectively reasonable that they are probably going to hear noise on Friday night at midnight. But if I rent a house in the middle of a suburban residential district, it's not reasonable that my neighbors got a band playing in their garage at midnight on a Wednesday. So those, the reasonable person standard allows you to have some grace and some discretion in a way that you won't necessarily get when you set specific decibel standards. The pro to the decibel standard is it takes the onerous off the code enforcement officer or the police officer to make that judgment call. From my experience, when you've got seasoned law enforcement or code enforcement officers, they don't have a problem making those judgment calls, they're used to it. But if it's new territory for somebody, um, it, it can be difficult to be the person who has to kind of weigh the pros and cons and make that decision. But think about what it means in the different districts and what is a reasonable time for you. When you're talking about noise ordinances and livability, you also have to think about what your noise regulations are going to mean for your economic development issues. And by that, I mean primarily construction and certain business activities. So particularly in the summer, in a place like Indiana, where it gets hot as Hades and the humidity is a killer, construction industry workers would rather work at 6 a.m. than 3 p.m. And so when you're building your noise ordinance, you wanna account for construction activities. And you may even wanna account for things like weather conditions. Um, in the long term, is it safer for those people to be working first thing in the morning than it is in the afternoon but if they work first thing in the morning, what does that do for adjacent property owners? You also wanna think about businesses that may already be in place and be putting out noise. So how is your ordinance going to impact them? So it, it's not enough to just focus on what it means to be a homeowner. You're gonna to wanna to focus on, 
how you've zoned, quite frankly, your entire city and the type of businesses and economic development activity you want to see. Because you've got your nuisance codes generally are going to apply to the whole city and they're all going to be interconnected together. Then we move on to our historic preservation codes. Um, and so this is interesting because I think a lot of people look at historic preservation codes um, narrowly. And by that, I mean, I think they look at them and think, well, it may not be for me because I don't really care or I don't really see the benefit. What I can tell you is that numerous studies, so the best study I, see, I saw came actually out of New York City. And, and I know that no place in Indiana is comparable to New York. But why I like their study is because they did a 35 year study. And what they studied was the various, what happened with each new historic designation within their overall jurisdiction. What did it do to the, the stability of the neighborhood? What did it do to the property values in the neighborhood? And what did it do to areas adjacent to the district? And uniformly what they found after 35 years of studying those was, was once an area was designated historic, it stabilized that area. It stabilized the structure, it encouraged revitalization to the same standard as the other already preserved district. It stabilized and actually increased the property tax value, the value of those homes, so property tax collection went up. And what the, what the people found most interesting was it actually also stabilized and increased property values on the edges of those districts. So all of those areas that were immediately adjoining the district also saw an increase in value and stability. So when people think of historic preservation codes, when I, when I say I think they think of it through a limited narrow, people tend to look at it as, oh, we're just saving an old house or we're just saving the street with a lot of old houses. But if you can look at it from a livability and stabilization lens, I think you can actually get more value out of this code. And, and in reality, Indiana's Historic Preservation Code is really a very generous code. Um, it's one of the few states that will actually allow governments to designate property um, in an assertive fashion instead of having to wait for full consent from the landowners. So, so if you've got an area that you've seen maybe starting to stumble or you're concerned that it, it may stumble in the future, if it meets the criteria, this particular code may actually be more useful for you than a property maintenance code, a rental inspection code, or your unsafe structure code. Um, and the benefits are there in the long term. Um, I will tell you if people object to the designation, they will object strenuously and strongly, um, but there's multiple avenues where this can be used to successfully stabilize neighborhoods. If you want to do a historic preservation district, you first have to have a local historic preservation code. Um, and that local historic preservation code has to follow the guidelines that are outlined in Indiana Code 36711. It is the exclusive method for how counties and cities can regulate historic properties in the state of Indiana. So you wanna be mindful of what that actually entails. Generally speaking, what it allows you as a local government entity to do is require a property owner to get prior approval before they demolish a structure, they move a structure, they conspicuously change an exterior appearance of the structure, or they're gonna do some type of new construction on the structure that will be visible from the public way. It's important to note that you can only regulate the exterior of these structures. You cannot touch on anything in the interior whatsoever. It's completely an exterior type of regulation. What it also does, which is really good for cities. So even if you think to yourself, I really don't wanna go through the process of designating historic structures, that's not gonna fly in my community. Consider adopting even a minor historic code. And when I say minor, there is a provision within the Indiana Historic Code that specifically requires, assuming you've adopted a local ordinance, that historic structures be maintained so that they cannot become derelict and vacant. And what I have seen some communities do is say, look, we don't want to be in the business of regulating what people generally do with their property but I do want an extra tool to prevent some, some blight or you know, vacant structures becoming deteriorated. And so they will adopt a historic preservation ordinance, um, but they will just 
designate those properties that are already listed, say, on the state's historic list or the national list of historic places. And the only regulation that they do with that list is requiring those structures to be maintained in a manner so that it cannot be deteriorated or become you know, derelict. And, and that is one slight avenue if you're not really ready to go into, nope, I wanna regulate the paint color, I wanna regulate the windows, I wanna regulate the roof tiles. If you're not there, you do have a lesser option that can still help slightly stabilize some of those areas in your community. So the next thing, once you know what type of code that you want to adopt, is actually adopting the code itself. Um, and I think that there's six overall steps that are pretty successful that you can use. Um, the first, and this is the most important one in my perspective, is you really need to identify what community concerns you have and develop a community vision. Um, you know, if I was going to say take a road trip today. I'm gonna be a lot more successful if I know my end destination. So if I know that I wanna drive from Salem, Oregon to Bloomington, Indiana, I'm probably gonna have a more successful trip than if I just get in the car and be like, all right, where am I going today? My bags are packed, I'm on the road, but I don't really know what I wanna do because I'm probably gonna hit some detours, I'm gonna to have to backtrack, I may have a bad experience, so you need a plan. Um, and that starts with getting community input because ultimately we all work for and represent the community. You need to establish a team or some type of committee that's going to lead you through the process of amending or creating a new code. You need to prepare draft codes. I'm going to say code or codes because some cities and counties will do one over encompassing livability code and others will do separate. They'll have a property maintenance code, a vacant structures code, a historic preservation code, a noise code, an animal code. You've got to decide what you want. Um, so you may have one code or multiple codes. You should seek feedback on that code and not just feedback from people who are supportive, but feedback from people who may think it's a bad idea. And then you need to evaluate those draft codes that you've written in light of the feedback you've received. And you're gonna obviously have to present those draft codes to your governing body. So when it comes to identifying your community concerns and developing a community vision, I think you need to ask yourself some questions like, what complaints are we receiving from our residents? Um, are we seeing an increase in nuisance complaints? Has there been a growing trend towards vacant properties? And these things are gonna change. So I, I, I haven't lived in the Midwest in five years, but I can tell you on the West Coast and in our communities here in Oregon, um, the two things that we've struggled with um, in the last three or four years, one may be applicable to you, one won't, um, is, um, is uh, it's unhoused human beings. Um, we have seen a rapid increase in the number of individuals who are experiencing homelessness in our communities. And that is impacting our community livability in the sense that we need to house these people, we need to take care of them, we need to respect them, we need to find the resources and solutions. But on the other hand, I, we do have business owners and park goers and community members saying, I can't get into businesses anymore because they're sleeping in front of doors or I don't feel safe taking my child to the, to the park because there's 25 tents around the playground, what do I do? Um, and that has been an issue that I've seen cities in my um, state really working on and trying to develop new strategies and visions and that will require them to update and change some of their codes. Um, the other nuisance issue we've been dealing with is um, in marijuana, recreational, uh, recreational and medicinal marijuana has been legalized um, at the state level, not the federal level, obviously, for some time. Um, and as it has been legalized, what we are now seeing a rash of is nuisance complaints regarding odor when it comes to um, marijuana grow facilities. And so I've been working with several communities now who are saying, okay, we've got to update our news, we've got to create an ordinance that deals with the odor of a marijuana grow, um, which isn't something we had to deal with five years ago. So you're going to want to go back and see what you're actually being asked to do by your residents. And then you want to ask your community governing bodies, your city council, your county commissioners, what is it that your community is supposed to look like in five years, in 10 years? Does your county or your city have a mission statement? What is it? Do they have a vision statement? Um, I would suggest that some of the most effective governing bodies have those two things and they use those two things to guide how they develop things like their comprehensive plan, which deals with land use under Indiana Code 3674. 
or they also use it to help build a community plan. And your community plan is different than your comprehensive plan, right? Your comprehensive plan tells you how you're gonna lay out the city, but community plans give you more, right? So it's the Midwest and the winter time is pretty cold. Swimming isn't usually a good idea, but what if your community is really heavily invested on, on swimming? You've got a huge robust community that likes to swim, that wants to play in the water. Maybe your community plan is, you know what? Maybe we need an indoor recreation water park facility in the next 10 years. Um, what's our community plan going to look like in terms of do we need a senior center? You know, have we seen an influx? Is our population aging? Are we becoming a retirement community? And we want to make sure we have a space specifically devoted to these people. And those are all things that you talk about as a governing body. What's our mission? What's our vision? What's our comp plan? What's our community plan? Where are we going? Because if you can do all of those things, then when you have to build your individual codes, you have something to refer back to. You know how to build those code enforcement provisions, right? I, I'm going to build a much better noise ordinance if I know what my community plan is. If my community plan is that we have a vibrant and eclectic arts and entertainment district, my noise ordinance is going to be impacted by that community plan. So it kind of starts there. That's the first piece. Um, depending on where your community is in its journey, if it doesn't have these things, then the entire journey to code development is probably going to take much longer. If you have these things, and again, my biggest pet peeve, if you haven't reviewed them recently, you should build a review of those documents into your overall process. Establish a team and committee to lead the process. This is a major undertaking. Um, so whenever I've done an ordinance, even a seemingly small ordinance, like a noise ordinance, you know, my noise ordinance is only five pages long. That's still a six month process because people care, right? I've got to talk with neighborhood associations. I've got to talk with bar owners. I've got to talk with industrial landowners. I've got to talk with my city councilors. I've got to talk with the law enforcement officers who enforce this. You're going to, have to talk with lots of people, which means there's multiple moving parts. And the best way to manage those moving parts is to have a team. And the team should be comprised of people who are reasonably impacted by the decisions you make and have some knowledge. So if you're going to take a noise ordinance, okay, fine. Do you have somebody in your organization, county or city who regularly deals with neighborhoods? That person should probably be on your committee. Your police chief should probably be on your committee. So you're going to want to figure out who needs to be on the team. And then you ask yourself, should it be limited solely to government officials? Is there merit in letting a quote unquote outsider join the team? So if it's a noise ordinance and you've got a local chamber of commerce, commerce or economic development team, maybe their director should sit on it. They might have some insight and connections into the business community that you yourself don't have. You do need to have a leader. <laughs> there needs to be somebody who's responsible for making sure everybody stays on track, handing out assignments and keeping everybody informed. Um, typically what I have seen um, is that once the committee is established, the committee appoints the leader themselves. In other instances, the executive, the chief executive officer of the local government unit will appoint the person. It's, it's really up to your individual community. And then you need to develop a timeline. And that timeline should not just be, okay, we're going to enact a property maintenance code and we're going to get it done in six months. You need to have some specific goals, objectives, and deadlines. When is the first, you know, when are we going to go out and talk with community members? Which community members are we talking with when? When's the first draft going to be done? When's the second draft going to be done? When are we going to loop in the council for the first time? That this is what we're thinking so we can go back if we don't have it right. You need to have a specific timeline. And part of the benefit of having a timeline when you draft a code is particularly if you're experiencing issues, is it kind of gives you a little bit of buffer from the community pushback, right? So you can say, look, we, we, you're right. Noise is a huge problem in this town, but we're working on it. Here's the team that we've committed. Here's our timeline. We, we will be meeting with you specifically in six weeks. We've got other meetings with people. We hope to have our first draft to the county commissioners um, by May 1st, something like that. It's important to have those timelines. Um, when you're talking about livability issues, again, you need to identify whether or not you want one code or multiple codes. If you go the multiple code route, you should make sure that it follows the same structure and regulatory principles, particularly if you're expecting those codes to be managed by the same division. So if you're going to have one ordinance that regulates, let's say, trash and another ordinance that regulates snow and a third ordinance that regulates grass, 
and they're all imposed by your community development department, it would be much easier for a community development department if the code all followed the same process. So if the notice requirements were the same, if the violation requirements were the same, if the fine levels were the same. So if you can have consistency among your code, it will be much better to actually put into implementation. You should make sure that you allow yourself time to study what comparable local units of government are doing with the regulation. So what are governments of a similar size or regional representation doing? I do encourage you to think outside the box and look at other communities outside of your state, but doing so while being mindful. Um, you know, if you called me and said, hey, Patty, can you send me what Eugene, Oregon does when it comes to trash? I will, but I would also tell you that remember, Eugene is a city in Oregon, which means it's state law and all of the judicial opinions coming from its Supreme Court are vastly different than Indiana. So take ideas, take concepts from other jurisdictions, but be mindful that those ideas and concepts may not inherently be permissible in Indiana. Doesn't mean don't do it. It just be, means be mindful and make sure you talk with your lawyer about whether or not you can do it. I don't think teams should create one draft. I think they should create multiple drafts before they take it out for public inspection. Um, make sure it's really working. I don't have a number, like it's not three, it's not five, but don't just do a one shot and call it done. Um, make sure you're meeting again to go over drafts to make sure that you all as a collective are comfortable with what you're going to submit outwardly first. Um, this is not, you know, self grandizing please don't take it this way. Um, if you don't have a lawyer on your team, you should have a lawyer review, I would say an early draft if possible, but always your final draft. The worst thing that you can do in my experience, the worst moments for lawyers are when you, you meet with a team and they've already invested a hundred hours of time and effort into something. And I look at it and I'm like, this isn't legally permissible. Indiana code provision 367-5-2 is not gonna allow you to do what you wanna do. That's super frustrating. Um, so if you can bring them in from the early part, you'll save a lot of staff time on your end and you'll make sure your drafts and ultimately your final project product uh, will meet snuff. The hard part, the hardest part of this whole thing is not presenting it to your county commissioners and your city council. It's gonna be seeking feedback from the community at large. And, and I strongly encourage you to reach out to those portions of the community that you believe may not be supportive. Uh, in my experience, that's where actually you're gonna get some of the most valuable information. Um, so from one of my examples, we were going to have to amend our sign code uh, because of some recent decisions by the US Supreme Court. And we were gonna be making changes to that impacted signs. And one of the biggest users of signs are real estate brokers. And I was nervous to go and meet with them because I didn't think they were gonna like it. And I was just expecting them to be disgruntled and they didn't like it and they were disgruntled, but the best feedback I got was from them. They made our ultimate code provision much, much better because they work with signs every day, I don't. Um, so you're gonna wanna figure out who's gonna be impacted, who's gonna care. If you have somebody or groups in your community that are the proverbial squeaky wheels, they care about everything, even if you can't figure it out, include them in the process. Um, and if you know that you're gonna need governing body support, seek support from them in advance. And so for example, if your council or your commissioners do work sessions, Go to a work session before you're ready to submit the final draft. Share it with them, get their feedback, get their comment. Because even if the whole community supports it and then you take it to council and they hate it, you're gonna to have to start over again. So get feedback from the people who are gonna make the ultimate decisions. It will make the whole process go longer in the long run. After you've received all of that feedback, you've gotta go back and evaluate your drafts. Did you get it right? We need to make tweaks. Do we not to start completely over? So you need to go back and kind of redraft and make edits. If you are making major substantive changes as a result of your feedback, then you should probably think about whether or not it warrants another round of feedback. So if you substantially and substantively modified your original draft, you may want to think about the political fallout if you don't go back to those groups and tell them the changes you've made. Um, and again, with each new draft before you're ready to make it go live or available, you wanna have a lawyer take a look at it. And then you've gotta present your draft to the governing body. Um, I have always been a big believer that even though it's not legally required, 
it is in your best interest to notify all of the persons with whom you sought feedback from of the dates and times you're going to your county council or your county or your city council. Let them know they were part of the process. So keep them involved in the process. If they choose to show up, great. If they don't, at least they've been informed. Um, most people get upset about a lack of process than they do about policy. So keep them apprised of where you are in the process. Um, make sure that you've kind of prepped the members of your governing body, either in a work session or in a detailed memo about what's happening. When you present the proposal, uh, what I have found is a successful tip is you've got to show your warts and all. So if people hate portions of your proposal, tell the council that in your opening remarks. Don't, don't let the council think that this is a big kumbaya moment for the community. If it's not, just be honest. You know, this is staff's proposal. I want to be really clear. Section five is strenuously objected to by the Chamber of Commerce. Here's the reasons why they've told staff that they have objected to it. And here's why staff is still recommending this position despite those objections. Um, just put it out there in front. You want to be offensive, not defensive. And then the last point on this slide is if during your presentation to the governing body, if the governing body makes substantive amendments to the proposal, you may wanna ask the governing body if they want you to go back for another feedback loop. Um, the, the best example I can say is years ago, um, my community had to comprehensively update and review um, its entire land development code. And it took us about two years to do it and we did countless meetings. And by the time I got to my city council, we didn't have a single member from the public care, um, not care, but they told us. I even had two or three big, you know, the realtors, the Chamber of Commerce had all said, Patty, please feel free to say on the record that we're supportive of this proposal. What that showed me was that all of the work I did on the front end saved me and the council, quite frankly, some significant long, lengthy and difficult discussions because we opened ourselves up and, and we had a legitimate conversation with our community. So think about those two. I've talked for a really long time, so we're at tool two. <laughs> and so I'm gonna ask Lisa um, to talk um, and I will mute myself. You'll hear a different voice. <laughs> Unless, do we have questions on tool one, Lisa? Sorry. We do We do have one question, but I'm gonna hold that one to the very okay. end. Okay. okay. So, um, but feel free to chime in, Patty, anytime that you want. Um, we're gonna talk about incentives. Um, so next slide, please. So we've talked a lot about um, doing code enforcement and developing um, codes that you can use for enforcement purposes. But some of the ways that we used to, when Patty and I worked together in code enforcement, um, minimize the amount that we had to do in code enforcement is we created opportunities for people to take care of things before it became a problem. So we offered a number of programs that are available in, you know, uh, through various means throughout the state that I thought you might find interesting. So one of our livability programs was we had an emergency home repair uh, in our community grant program where we provided grants to uh, low to moderate income households that needed to make a safety or habitability repair to their home. Um, this uh, program in Bloomington was funded by community development block grant money, um, which is available through the state um, if you are not a participating jurisdiction. So, but these were very small um, grants. Um, I think the maximum grant at the time that I left was about $7,000. And we used them um, in a lot of cases to repair um, failing roofs and, um, and do some other minor um, housing repairs. But helping somebody solve their roofing problem often will help them solve future problems for their entire structure. So that was a very effective way to not end up with a vacant unit or a unsafe structure issue. Um, we also, if we had a, a, a problem that was beyond maybe just making a simple repair, we had a program called Owner Occupied Rehabilitation um, Program. This is also a program that is available through funding through the um, Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority if you are not a participating jurisdiction. Um, this was um, in some cases partially a grant, partially a loan program for our community, but you can design those programs to meet your community needs. Like Patty said, every community has to determine how their community is going to structure their programs to meet their citizens 
um, needs. So this program made substantial repairs to properties, including exterior repairs, so that we could deal with, you know, curb appeal issues. But it also helped with, um, you know, uh, bringing properties up to code: basic plumbing, electric um, code, um, HVAC. Um, sometimes dealing with broken windows and other issues that um, impacted a property, including uh, grading a property um, to deal with drainage issues. And then we also had a program called Home Modification for Accessible Living. And this is called a bunch of different names in different communities and, and through other state programs. But these are programs that make accessibility modifications to um, properties so that people can age in place. And so one of the things that we want to do is we want, I mean, she talked about, you know, encouraging, you know, people having a place maybe for seniors or for, you know, people who are experiencing disabilities to be able to remain in their homes because they're part of our fabric and we want to maintain those um, units for them. And so this was a simple um, program where we would um, do um, ramps into a home, we would uh, modify bathrooms to make them accessible. We might swap out like um, appliances such as the stove. I and mean, one of the things that people don't necessarily think about, but is if you are in a wheelchair and you have a stove where the buttons to run the stove are on the back side of the, um, you know, the stove, so you have to reach across the burners in order to adjust the temperature or turn them on and off. That can be a problem if you are, well, um, short like myself or um, in a wheelchair. And so, you know, maybe swapping that out with a stove with the buttons on the front makes that house now more um, livable for that person. So there were some simple codes that we could, um, or programs that we could bring to the table to help people solve some of their issues so that they didn't end up becoming a code enforcement case. And so we used these programs um, to, um, to help them be able to maintain their properties and create our livable neighborhoods. Next slide, Patty. Okay, um, this was actually a really great program that we had um, at the city um, that did a lot of things for us. So the first one is the neighborhood cleanup grant program. So we had neighborhoods that would apply to get a cleanup. We did two every summer and we would bring our city trucks and our city sanitation truck, as you can see here. And, um, you know, and we would um, help neighborhoods get rid of trash. So we would take trash from the neighborhood, um, you know, anything. And most fascinating thing, you would watch all the neighbors come to the sanitation truck whenever this would happen, but somebody would bring an old couch and the sanitation truck would eat the couch and everyone would watch. But we would also do yard waste and other things, hazardous materials. We would have a, um, a dumpster for recycled materials, so metal, so that the money would get, um, the recycling would go to a salvage yard and the money that we collected in our community from those things, we gave back to the neighborhood association so that they could use it for neighborhood association programs. So it removed a lot of the issues that we would see in our um, trash ordinance issue. So for example, Patty talked about, you know, mosquitoes and, and stuff. One of the main culprits for mosquito um, breeding is is tires. And so we would take tires and we would take dispose of them properly and we would get them off people's property, which would then help with controlling our mosquito population and gets rid of unsightly tires. Um, so we would um, do this program for neighborhoods that would apply and it did a couple of things for us. One is it helped us get rid of things that were likely to end up being a trash complaint or a trash issue for us in the future. And it would also help us create relationships with our neighborhoods. So we are, we're there, you know, we're there, we're working side by side with them, we're helping them get rid of things that they want to get rid of. And we don't go around and say, you need to get rid of that. They bring it to, as you can see, a central location and, and dispose of it. But it created these relationships that we had with them so that when we had some other issues, such as a housing issue, and we could say, you know, you know, we know that you have this housing issue because we've gotten this complaint and we have this program. We're no longer scary government people. We're those people who helped me take my tires in so that I didn't have to deal with them. 
We also um, had another program called the Pick It Up Campaign where we provided litter um, trash bags to citizens that were interested in doing litter patrol. This was really um, effective in just keeping basic litter um, in our communities down and was helpful because, you know, I don't know about your community, but you know, sometimes people are not always um, respectful about where they throw their stuff when they're done with it. And um, our dog walkers were very um, into this program when we would give out a lot of bags and it kept, it kept litter down, um, but it was a inexpensive way to minimize future trash complaints because whether you threw it out there or not, if the trash is on your property, you're responsible. And and so, at least in our community, so um, it was a way for us to minimize complaints from um, blowing litter. And then we also don't want to forget our downtown, our commercial um, community members. And so we um, would do a downtown cleanup every year. This was a citizen driven effort to remove trash and clean up graffiti from the downtown areas. So we would organize volunteers um, that, that would come to the city and we would do litter patrol and trash pickup and graffiti um, uh, mitigation um, in our downtown properties. Now, because I had a very good lawyer, and you can imagine, if you're going to do graffiti cleanup, I'm not a lawyer, I just play one on TV, so to speak. Um, but if you're gonna, my understanding is if you're gonna do uh, graffiti cleanup on someone's private property, you need to have permission. So make sure you get your permission slip signed before you do anything. And if you're gonna do graffiti cleanup on a historic property, you probably need to think about the materials that the pro property is made out of because some things would be inappropriate for historic brick or historic limestone. Um, you know, chemicals it might use for graffiti cleanup. So you need to be cautious about what materials that you're using. But these programs do a, a number of things. They create uh, positive relationships and they also help us minimize future issues that will turn into um, complaint, um, could, 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 that could turn into complaint um, cases. Um, and that reminds me, um, I wanted to, point out one other thing when Patty was talking about the unsafe building ordinance, which I also did with her, um, the cheat sheet that she refers to was developed by her and it was incredibly useful and it should be a public document. So you should be able to get your hands on it because it was a step-by-step -step, Lisa do this now. Okay. Kind of thing. And I really appreciated it. So if you're going to do that, you should definitely um, try to get your hands on that. All right. Next slide, please. All right, and then again, historic preservation was something that Patty and I worked on as well. Um, we had a couple of programs that um, we did with our historic preservation program. One was our historic exterior program, which was um, sometimes a grant, sometimes a loan, depending on the circumstances to restore historic homes exteriors. Um, this is actually um, a picture of a house that we helped um, a local housing development corporation move to this location and put on a new foundation. And then we provided them with some funding to um, do some exterior um, improvements to this property. That might be more extensive than what you want to do, but there are programs that you could just maybe help them with paint, um, which would be, you know, relatively inexpensive that might um, spruce up your historic districts. And then we also um, had our historic facade program, which was sometimes a grant, sometimes a loan, again, depending on the circumstances, to restore historic exteriors on commercial properties, because we don't want to forget our commercial um, community members. Um, you know, our commercial districts really do impact our the livability of our communities, and we wanted to make sure that we were providing them with some programs in order to take advantage of um, ways to make their areas um, look historically appropriate or, or, or just more lovely. Um, okay, I think at that point, we're going on to tool three, Patty. Um, so this, this section should be a little bit quicker. Um, I wanna be mindful of time. Um, so when all of your code, so you've written your code, you've got everything done and 95% of your population complies, yay. Um, and then of the 5% who won't, um, the incentives, the financial and economic incentives that Lisa discussed or the community incentives like neighborhood cleanup, those, those brought in the other 3%, yay. But unfortunately, um, you've got 2% 
who you're going to have to use actual enforcement measures and penalties on. Two things that I ask everybody to keep in mind. If you are a community who has never really done code enforcement before, or you're a community who has only sort of kind of done it, there's two things that you really must keep in mind. The first is to be patient. If your citizens and business owners have gotten used to you having a code on the books that you don't enforce, they're gonna to continue to do what they wanna do because they're not gonna trust or believe that you really are gonna issue fines, that you really are gonna issue abatement orders, or that you're serious about going in and abating it yourself and assessing the cost of the lien on their property. So you wanna be patient. Uh, when I started at the city of Bloomington, um, our code enforcement cases were really, really low. And it probably took us about two or three years before we got to a point where let's say I only had 50% compliance where we were at the 90% compliance because they realized that the city was serious. Yep, they're gonna issue a fine. Yep, if I don't pay that fine, they're gonna take me to court. If I still don't do anything, they're gonna issue an abatement order and holy crud, they're actually assessing a lien against my property and I could lose this at the next tax sale. So you need to be patient. And then the second one is education is key. Um, every lawyers will say knowledge of the law is no excuse for not complying with it. Well, those are lawyers and we're annoying. Um, the reality is be a good government steward. Um, your citizens aren't watching all of your council meetings. I know sometimes that may feel that way, um, but that's not true. Um, probably the most unprofessional flip it comment I ever made, we were going to regulate pawn shops and my deputy mayor came up after me because we had about 40 people show up at the city council meeting. And he said, oh my gosh, Patty, did we make a mistake? That's a lot of people, what do you think? And I said, I don't know, 79,960 people don't seem to care, sir, flippant, inappropriate. But the point was the vast majority of your citizens aren't necessarily watching your council meetings. They may not understand what you're doing. So you need to educate them on new provisions. Um, get out there and show them what you want. Don't just come out with a stick right away. So if I have any code enforcement officers who are paying attention, people who work with code enforcement officers, there's a few key tips that I think will make things successful first um, for you. Specifically, verify that a violation has occurred. So if you get a complaint, you actually wanna verify that the complaint is true. Or if you're just doing a normal inspection, make sure that the complaint you're saying about does exist. Take notes and take photographs. Uh, make sure you have some type of documentation because if the enforcement action is gonna go south, it's probably gonna be six to 12 months before you're in front of a judge and you're not gonna remember exactly what happened. So you want notes and photographs to back it up. Make sure you issue the required warnings or notices in, a code, in accordance with your code's processes and requirements. So if your code requires you to start with a verbal reprimand, then you need to make sure you give that verbal reprimand and you need to document in the file the date you gave it, the time you gave it, where were you when you gave it. So Patty, I'm Patty Movahill, met with Joe Smith who owns 123 South Main Street on February 1st at 2.22 p.m. wherein I verbally advised him that his grass exceeded the height required by the code and put it in the notes. If you have to give a written warning, make sure you do. Make sure those orders all say what they're supposed to say under the code. The worst thing that can happen is that the property was in violation, the person did refuse to correct it, but you get to court and you find out that the notice you issued didn't comply with the actual code. So you lose the case, not because you were factually wrong, but because you didn't follow the proper process. Make sure that in addition to issuing the notices, you actually try, track compliance within the notice timeframes. So if you tell somebody they have 14 days to comply with it, don't go back and check the property 45 days later. Maybe go back and check on day 15 or 16. If it's a difficult case, one that you've never experienced before, you feel like there might be some gray area with the facts or the interpretation of the code might be a little difficult, or if it's a difficult property owner, right? If it's somebody your community has a history with, somebody who you believe to be litigious, um, talk with the department head or your lawyer if necessary, as soon as possible. I always used to like to tell my clients, if we know it's gonna be difficult before you issue the first notice, we're still gonna follow the same process, but I might have you not just dot every I and cross every T, I might have you take two or three additional steps because I know I'm gonna end up in court and I want the best possible case when I do. This is a big one, don't bluff. If you say you're gonna abate, abate. Because what will happen, no matter how big of a community you think you are, it's actually gonna be really small. And so if you threaten to abate a property, if they don't fix it, 
and then you never do it, that property owner is going to talk to other property owners who talk to other property owners. So a year later, when you have a problem with a different property and you tell them to abate, or you tell them to fix it, they may not because they're going to think that you're bluffing. Weigh the pros and cons of moving to the litigation stage. If you are not lucky enough to have an in-house attorney, taking something to court is going to be it's gonna cost you some money. Um, I, I did my hourly rate as a government attorney and I almost cried, um, but you wanna make sure that you that the pros and cons are there. Um, litigation costs are real. You need to factor those into your decisions. When you inspect properties, I've got some tips that I encourage people to do. Your inspections should be uniform and consistent. So if you have multiple inspectors, you wanna make sure they're following the same processes. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, they inspect the buildings the same way. Not that if you go into the building, you always go left and then work your way, but that they're always checking for the same thing. They're always looking for the same thing. That then relates to the reports that your inspectors issue as well as their notices. They should all look the same. They should be on the same format. They should require the same details. So if Joe and Julie, if Julie's doing an inspection and then she gets sick, Joe can come in and finish the inspection and nobody in the world besides Joe and Julie would know it because it would be a seamless transition. Make sure that if there is a violation, you always re reference the statute or ordinance that has been violated and then you follow it up with plain language. It doesn't do a property owner any good for your notice to say violation of Bloomington Municipal Code 6.02040. Excellent. Thank you. That's not helpful information. Yes, the code may be available online, but you assume that I A, have internet connectivity, B, a computer, or C, are savvy enough to figure out that I need to go look at it online. It should say violation of Bloomington Municipal Code 6.02040, which prohibits property owners from having trash in their front yard. You need to tell them what it is they have to do. Keep all of your inspector notes in the property file. Um, Indiana is a state that requires you to maintain public records. Inspector notes are public records, which means they should be maintained in one file, not an individual inspector's desk. If you do maintain property files on properties that are in violation, anybody who goes out to the property should always read the file before they do an inspection. Particularly if you're talking about a case that is already in litigation, um, you should not take any action until you review the file to make sure that you're not about to mess up the court case. Um, always take detailed notes, supplement with photographs and videos whenever it's possible. Uh, if a property again becomes problematic during your inspections, loop your supervisor in. Um, I've worked with inspectors before where we had property owners who had made unfounded allegations of discriminatory conduct. Um, it was actually litigated and we were found to have done nothing wrong. But as a result, that property owner who owned multiple properties, we had, a, we had an unwritten rule that nobody inspected that property by themselves. Um, some of it was protecting our employees. And I cannot stress this enough, never, ever, 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 ever enter a property unless you have permission to do so. If you don't have permission, if you don't think you have permission, if you're unsure of whether or not you have permission, you need to work with a lawyer to get an administrative search warrant. It sounds like a really big deal, it's not. Judges and lawyers are used to getting them. Um, the reality is my clients can come to me and I could usually get in front of a judge within 24 hours. Um, it's always better to get a warrant than it is to go onto somebody's property without their authority because then you're going to end up as a governmental entity um, violating somebody's constitutional rights, which is a big deal. If you're on the call and at some point you find yourself to be a witness, um, either at a deposition um, an administrative hearing, or you actually have to sit in the witness box in court, um, I've got some tips for you. Um, I litigated for about 15 years before I took this job. So I've been in jury trials and bench trials, hundreds of depositions. So these are some of my practical tips. First, know your code. And by that, I mean, you don't have to have the whole code memorized, but you should know where to look. Um, so when I used to work with my fire officers, you know, if you've ever looked at a fire code, like the Indiana fire code is literally like this thick. Um, they don't have that whole code memorized and I would never expect them to, but I would expect them to be able to easily and quickly flip to the section on smoke detectors or fire extinguishers or fire separation requirements so that they are at least familiar and know where to go while they're on the stand. You need to know the violation and be able to explain it in terms that I'm going to use this term lay people can understand. I am not an engineer. I am not an architect. I am not a 
I am not, I don't know how to build a building. If you told me it's a 10 by 10 building, I don't know what that means. So you, as a witness, you have to assume that you may be talking to a judge who's like Patty. They may have no idea when you say two by four or 10 by, they don't, they don't know what that means. So use words that people who are not in your industry can understand. Make sure any photographs and video and documentation you want to submit has previously been reviewed by your lawyer and you know what all of it says. Um, if you're going to put something before the judge or the jury, you're going to want to make sure that you're comfortable knowing what it is, when it was taken, and why it's relevant to the case you're presenting. This bullet point is the hardest bullet point for every single witness I've ever worked with except one. Only answer the question you have been asked. Do not volunteer anything more. You will find yourself at some point being interviewed or cross-examined, and you know what they want. You know, they're just not asking the question right. They're getting close. And so you, as a good human, are going to try and be super helpful and give it to them. Do not. Um, because you may end up, A, giving them something that hurts, this, hurts your entity or giving them something that takes us down a terrible rabbit hole. Only answer the questions you are asked. That means if you get asked a yes or no question, you only provide yes or no. Don't expand. Be respectful. Be polite and be honest, don't lie. If your supervisor tells you to lie, don't do it. You are under oath. The only person who is responsible for you not committing perjury is yourself, so be honest. And that means if you don't know, just say, I don't know. You can find yourself on a witness stand 18 months after something happened. It's perfectly reasonable for you to be like, I don't know, or I don't remember. I've slept since then. Say it respectfully, not like that. Um, but it's okay to say, I don't know, or I don't remember. Let your lawyer do the arguing for you. Um, unfortunately, there are lawyers who believe in being super aggressive and loud and almost kind of overpowering and overbearing. Um, and it can be intimidating and it can also be frustrating and mad. And this person's yelling at you and you're constrained in this tiny little box and you wanna defend yourself and defend your city. Don't, that's not your job. That's your lawyer's job to handle. It's your job to think to yourself, as my mother would say, be the bigger person. Be the professional person who can sit in the box, answer the questions that are asked, and not be annoyed. Prepare with your lawyer as many times as you think are necessary. Um, Lisa, Lisa joked with me that we could do this in our sleep. So the reality is if Lisa and I were going to a trial, our prep time was much, much less than most people would probably think is appropriate. But that's because we did probably 100 trials together. And so we knew what we were going to do. Um, if I had a new person or a new inspector, I, one of the inspectors I've worked with for years, we prepped for hours before everyone, no matter how many times we went. Um, so make sure that you feel comfortable before you take the stand. And that's all I have. I've, I've got questions and it looks like we do actually have time for questions. We do have time for questions. And so um, we have a question that I'm, I've been holding that I'm gonna ask you that is gonna take us down a rabbit hole. Okay. I'm, I'm going to just say that up front. Okay. So, the I might take notes then. <laughs> the, um, in your multicolored pen? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, the, ultimate, uh, the elements of livability that you outline don't mention density, which is a huge issue in Bloomington slash Monroe County. What are your thoughts on how these tools impact the ability of communities to create denser housing in a market that is desperate for more units? And as you are aware, this is true in Oregon too, you know, um, everybody has a housing inventory shortage right now. And, uh, and a lot of communities are trying to figure out ways to create additional units. So how do you think that these codes might impact the ability to create denser housing? Um, I don't think that they will. So I will say we have a, um, Oregon is one of those states. I don't know that it got as much press as Minneapolis did. But um, any city in Oregon effective in 2022 that has a population of 15,000 or greater has to allow at least duplex up to quadplexes in every, every residential zone. So there's no single, there's no more single family zoning in cities um, 15,000 or greater. And if you are a city with a population of 25,000, you have to allow um, essentially commercial buildings or commercial like multifamily kind of spaces because we're looking for denser housing. And I don't think that livability codes traditionally impact your ability to have denser housing, but I think they could, the denser housing could create 
issues for those codes. So I, I will give you an example. So when you put more people in a tighter space, and I'm not going to comment on whether I think denser housing is appropriate or not appropriate. I, I personally believe that as an individual community choice. I am a firm believer in home rule. You design your community as you see fit. Um, but when you put more people together, you run the risk of having more people be close to each other to be annoyed by no, noise. You are going to have more trash accumulation. The, the, basically, when you put more people together, we're more likely to annoy each other. So what I would tell you is that if you are passing land development codes that require tighter density, it would make sense to review those codes. So, all right, so we went from only allowing single family property into this district, and now we can have quadplexes. And we only have quarter acre lots. And so I'm gonna put a quadplex on a quarter acre lot. What does that do to noise carriage? What does that do to trash? What does that look like? Does that mean that my traditionally owner occupied neighborhood is now 25% rental? And does that mean that we now need to have a rental inspection program because I'm worried that they won't be maintained? So I don't think the fact that your dense inherently impacts it, but I think to do it responsibly, you need to not put that code in effect without considering, do you need to update those other ordinances? And the reality is you may not know so you may not really know how it's going to impact. What I would do, and this is easier said than done. So let's say your ordinance that's gonna require denser living is gonna go into effect on June 1st of this year. What I might do is say, okay, look, realistically, it's not gonna happen overnight, right? You're not gonna have dense communities on June 1st. You're probably not even gonna have it on July 1st. It's probably gonna take a year, right? So if it's June 1st, 2021, I might put myself a calendar tickler reminder for June 1st in 2023, two years later, and see if I've got a problem. Um, and by that, I mean, it gives them a year to start building and adding in the infill. And then you've got a year to see what that added infill did. Did you get an increase in noise complaints? Did you get an increase in trash? Have you seen a dearth of new rental properties entering the market? What does that do? And, and do those complaints need to translate into updates to your code. That's what I think you're gonna to need to do when you start increasing density in areas. Okay, thanks. All right, we didn't need, and you did that well enough that we didn't go down um, a scary rabbit hole. I appreciate that. So um, do we have any other questions? Because this is you know, a good opportunity to get information from somebody who has been in the trenches. I want to thank Patty for taking her time to do this so early in the morning for her, for me. Um, I really appreciated it um, greatly. It was um, really informative. We've gotten a lot of comments about how informative it was and what great advice that you gave them. So the, um, the participant or the attendees also appreciated all of your good information. We have been recording this and it will be available on our website. Um, probably in two weeks. Um, so you'll probably get a notice um, saying when it's up so that you can share it with other people um, that you think might find it useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. If you've missed any of our other housing webinar series, um, please go on our website and check them out. We've covered an, a, quite a broad um, spectrum of, of topics. So thank you very much for participating today and hopefully we'll see you at our next session. Thank you.